Saudi Arabia might be best known for its vast deserts and scorching heat, but this arid kingdom holds a surprising secret. It's becoming a global hub for coastal ecosystem restoration. While most people associate Saudi Arabia with sand dunes and oil, its coastlines along the Red Sea and Persian Gulf tell a very different story, one of resilience, biodiversity, and bold environmental innovation. Amid the sand and salt, Saudi Arabia is not only farming marine life in the desert, but also nurturing forests, specifically mangrove forests. These green coastal thickets thrive in saltwater environments and perform vital ecological services. They buffer the land against the encroaching sea, shelter marine life, capture carbon, and support local economies. But despite their importance, these forests are under serious threat. Years of industrial development, oil extraction, and rapid urbanization have left mangroves degraded and fragmented. Now, in an unexpected twist, Saudi scientists are turning to an unlikely ally to help bring them back. Crabs. Yes, crabs. Small, scuttling crustaceans with snapping claws and a surprising knack for soil engineering. Researchers believe these creatures could be key to reviving the kingdom's most critical coastal ecosystems. Mangroves stretch like ribbons of green along the Red Sea coast, from Tabuk Bay in the north to the Naron Gulf in the south. They occupy about 52 square miles, spread across over 5,000 individual patches, many of them tiny, isolated clusters. These fragmented habitats face extreme environmental pressures, high temperatures, hypersaline waters, and tidal stress. Yet two species dominate despite the odds, Avicennia marina, known for its aerial roots that filter silt and support microscopic life, and Rhizophora mucronata, whose dense root systems blunt the force of waves and storms. Mangroves act as natural coastal defense systems. Their roots absorb excess nutrients and organic matter from the water, improving water quality and preventing harmful algal blooms. In the Red Sea, where warm, salty conditions can easily tip marine ecosystems into imbalance, mangroves are essential for maintaining environmental stability. They also provide critical habitat. Their submerged roots form nurseries for fish and shrimp, sustaining local fisheries. Studies show that catches near mangroves are 30 to 50 percent higher than in open sandy areas, and they store carbon, lots of it. Mangrove ecosystems sequester organic carbon two to four times more efficiently than rainforests. That makes them indispensable in Saudi Arabia's climate action plans, including the Green Initiative and the Red Sea Global Project, both of which aim to expand mangrove coverage substantially. There's also an economic side to mangroves. Ecotourism in mangrove zones through nature walks, bird watching, and guided kayak tours generates jobs and builds awareness transforming local communities into active stewards of these vital ecosystems. Despite their resilience, Saudi Arabia's mangroves are facing collapse in some areas, rising salinity now exceeding 40 parts per thousand in parts of the Red Sea, and summer temperatures nearing 88 degrees Fahrenheit stress mangrove trees. These extremes sap energy from the trees, reducing their productivity and carbon storing capacity but human impact is an even greater threat. Since the 1950s, Saudi Arabia has lost 55% of its mangrove forests due to development, road construction, and land reclamation. Oil extraction and refining have introduced hydrocarbons, heavy metals, and other contaminants into coastal soils. These pollutants choke mangrove roots, disrupt natural microbial processes, and reduce soil fertility. Mangroves rely on microscopic partners, bacteria and fungi that break down organic matter and help feed the trees. In polluted areas, these beneficial microbes die off or become less active. The result? The soil becomes inhospitable, and new mangrove seedlings struggle to survive. This is where the crabs come in. At King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, KAUST, scientists are testing a novel restoration method using fiddler crabs, small crustaceans known for digging burrows and constantly turning over soil. It's a process called bioturbation, and researchers believe it could help restore microbial health in damaged mangrove zones. The team began by collecting medium-sized, active fiddler crabs from healthy mangrove stands. 
They carefully transported them in oxygenated containers to test plots near degraded mangrove areas. Each plot measured about 10 square feet. Some were left untouched as controls, while others received 100 to 120 crabs, over three times the natural density. Within days, the crabs got to work, digging burrows up to 12 inches deep. These tunnels aerated the soil, creating oxygen-rich microzones that revived anaerobic bacteria. The researchers took soil samples at three depths and analyzed pH, salinity, carbon levels, and microbial diversity. The results were striking. Salinity dropped by 12% and pH rose from 6.1 to 6.8 in crab-rich plots, both crucial for mangrove health. Most importantly, the number of beneficial iron-reducing bacteria skyrocketed, enhancing nutrient availability and making the soil more fertile for young mangrove trees. Beyond improving soil chemistry, crabs also help physically plant mangroves. As they scurry across the mud, they unintentionally transport propagules, elongated seed-like structures that sprout while still attached to the parent tree. Crabs dislodge, carry, and bury these propagules in their burrows, which provide ideal shelter from waves, predators, and direct sun. These burrows offer better drainage and oxygenation than the surrounding swampy ground, helping seedlings take root and survive their vulnerable early months. In essence, crabs serve as both soil engineers and natural gardeners. Their burrows also create unique microhabitats, cooler, wetter areas that support higher biodiversity. Invertebrates, small fish, and microorganisms all benefit. It's a cascade of positive effects that begin with one simple behavior, digging. Encouraged by early results, KAUST researchers are now preparing to transplant mangrove seedlings into crab-enhanced soils. If survival and growth rates improve significantly, the method could be scaled up across thousands of degraded acres. Crabs may become an essential low-cost tool for mangrove reforestation, not only in Saudi Arabia, but in similar climates worldwide. But the kingdom isn't stopping at crustaceans. Saudi Arabia is launching one of the world's most ambitious mangrove restoration efforts, combining high-tech tools with boots-on-the-ground action. Since 2021, the National Center for Vegetation Cover and Combating Desertification, NCVC, has led Saudi Arabia's reforestation charge. By July 2024, more than 13 million mangrove seedlings had been planted across the Red Sea and Persian Gulf coasts. Plantings include 5.5 million in Jazan, 2.4 million in Mecca, 2 million in Medina, 1.5 million in Tabuk, 1 million in Asir, 500,000 in the eastern province. Each planting site is fenced and regularly monitored to ensure survival. Additional efforts by the Vegetation Cover Development Foundation have added another 2.4 million trees. These projects use tidal models, marine nutrients, and multi-step maintenance strategies to boost success. Corporate partners are involved too. The Saudi National Bank funded 100,000 seedlings in Jubail. Joint sponsorships have added tens of thousands more in the eastern region. All this work supports the kingdom's goal of planting 10 million mangroves by 2027. Saudi Aramco, the national oil giant, has planted more than 43 million mangrove trees under its Rahima Bay Mangrove Eco Park project. Since 1993, the company has built nurseries, field labs, and visitor platforms to foster mangrove conservation. Why? In part to offset carbon. Each mangrove tree can absorb up to 1.5 tons of CO2 over 60 years, making this effort both symbolic and strategic. Red Sea Global, which manages major coastal tourism projects, opened a dedicated mangrove nursery in 2023 with a goal of growing 50 million seedlings by 2030. Seedlings are nurtured to 31 inches before being transplanted to coastal parks. Saudi Arabia's leadership in mangrove restoration mirrors a growing global trend. In Ecuador, the dredging company John de Nul created a man-made island for mangroves, transforming dredge sediment into 123 acres of restored habitat. Carefully engineered channels and erosion barriers helped boost seedling survival to over 85%. In the UAE, Drones are revolutionizing mangrove planting. Partnering with distant imagery, 
Abu Dhabi has already used drones to plant over 200,000 seeds in a single project. These drones can drop 2,000 seeds in under 10 minutes, accelerating reforestation at unprecedented scale. Saudi Arabia's mangrove restoration effort is a bold experiment in ecological recovery, mixing science, tradition, and emerging technology. From fiddler crabs stirring up microbial life to drones reforesting entire lagoons, this multifaceted approach offers hope not just for Saudi Arabia, but for coastal ecosystems around the world. In one of the harshest climates on Earth, life is finding a way back, and it's doing so with the help of unexpected allies. This Emirati entrepreneur is using an innovative technique to grow food in the desert. He's using a fish farm. Picture this. You're standing in the middle of the Saudi Arabian desert, where temperatures regularly soar past 104 degrees Fahrenheit, and rain is so rare it's practically a myth. The landscape stretches endlessly. 95% of the country is nothing but sand, rocks, and brutal heat. This is where plants go to die, right? Wrong. In 2023, Saudi Arabia threw away over 100,000 tons of fish in these very deserts. But here's the twist that'll blow your mind. They're not throwing them away. They're using them as weapons. Weapons against the desert itself. What sounds like environmental madness is actually the most genius strategy you've never heard of. While the rest of the world struggles with food security and climate change, Saudi Arabia has figured out how to turn the ocean's bounty into desert-conquering ammunition. They're literally farming fish in places where nothing should survive, then using those fish to transform barren wasteland into thriving green oases. This isn't some small-scale experiment either. By 2030, they plan to produce 600,000 tons of seafood annually, most of it in the middle of nowhere. And the craziest part? It's working so well that countries with perfect growing conditions are now importing food from the Saudi desert. But here's what nobody's talking about. This isn't just about fish. It's about completely rewriting the rules of what's possible on our planet. Let me break down exactly how they're pulling off this impossible feat. Because the strategy is pure genius. Saudi Arabia has always been stuck between two massive bodies of water, the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf, yet dying of thirst in the middle. For decades, they overfished these waters like everyone else, hauling in 88,000 tons of seafood annually by 2012. But then they realized something that changed everything. The ocean was running out of fish, but the desert was running out of life. Enter Saudi Vision 2030, their moonshot program to become completely oil independent. While most people focus on Neom, their futuristic city project, the real revolution is happening in aquaculture. In just over a decade, they've grown from 17,200 tons to 140,000 tons of fish production. That's an 800% increase in desert-based fish farming. But here's where it gets wild. They're not just farming regular fish. They're raising salmon and trout in the middle of the desert. Species that need cold water are now thriving in Saudi Arabia's brutal heat. The facility in Hale produces 5 million young salmon annually and 100 tons of market-ready fish. These desert-raised salmon are being shipped to Japan, South Korea, and Australia, countries with perfect natural conditions for fish farming. Here's what most people don't know about fish farming. Every fish is basically a living fertilizer factory. When fish digest food, they release waste packed with nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. These aren't just random chemicals, they're the holy trinity of plant growth. Nitrogen feeds the green parts of plants, leaves and stems. Phosphorus powers the energy-intensive processes that help plants survive drought. Potassium regulates water balance, controlling how much moisture plants retain during extreme heat. It's like creating a custom-made survival cocktail for desert plants. But here's the breakthrough. Instead of treating fish waste as a problem to dispose of, Saudi scientists realized it was liquid gold. This nutrient-rich water transforms regular irrigation into a supercharged plant growing system. Saudi researchers ran controlled experiments comparing regular water irrigation versus fish farm water irrigation. The results? Date palms irrigated with fish water produced dates that were 26% heavier, 23% longer, and had 43% more moisture content. Basil plants increased their wet weight by 203%. These aren't small improvements. Their game-changing differences? The National Aquaculture Group supplies 100,000 tons of seafood to 32 countries while simultaneously feeding the desert. They've mastered the entire production cycle, from hatcheries to processing facilities, all located in sandy regions that shouldn't support any life. You might wonder how fish survive in 104 degrees Fahrenheit plus desert heat. 
The answer is next-level technology that constantly monitors temperature, oxygen levels, and food supplies. These facilities create ocean-like conditions in the middle of nowhere using advanced filtration, cooling systems, and closed-loop water circulation. They're using three irrigation methods that maximize every drop. Drip irrigation delivers water directly to plant roots with minimal waste. Subsurface irrigation uses buried pipes to feed root zones without surface evaporation. Micro-sprinkler systems target individual plants while cooling the surrounding air. The most advanced facilities use aquaponics, a closed-loop system where fish waste feeds plants, and plants clean the water for fish. The hail facility produces 10 tons of fruits and vegetables annually using this method. While that sounds small, remember this is happening in one of the hottest, driest places on Earth. Plot twist. 47% of Saudi Arabia's aquaculture production is shrimp. In 2023, they produced 66,400 tons of shrimp in the desert. Nakwa uses seawater trucked directly from the Red Sea, then employs bioflock technology where beneficial bacteria break down waste and serve as additional shrimp food. They're even farming algae in the desert. King Abdullah University of Science and Technology operates a commercial-scale algae facility producing 100 tons of dry algae biomass annually. They've developed proprietary strains of spirulina and chlorella adapted to seawater, eliminating freshwater needs entirely. This brings us back to Neom, Saudi Arabia's futuristic city project. Topian, a company linked to Neom, plans to build one of the Middle East's largest fish farms, producing 20,000 tons of seafood annually. But here's the real purpose. The nutrient-rich water will feed the Neom Regreening Initiative, which aims to restore 3.7 million acres of land and plant 100 million native trees by 2030. This isn't just about Saudi Arabia solving their food security problems. This is about completely rewriting what's possible on our planet. Every desert-based aquaculture facility serves double duty, producing food while fighting desertification. The nutrient-rich water doesn't just feed plants. It improves soil moisture retention and supports beneficial microbial life. This transforms barren sand into fertile soil that can support vegetation for decades. The new vegetation creates its own microclimate. Trees and shrubs provide shade, reduce ground temperature, and through transpiration, they raise air humidity. This makes conditions more favorable for other plants, creating a self-sustaining cycle of desert transformation. Saudi Arabia's aquaculture industry is targeting 250,000 tons of production by 2030 through Nakwa alone. That's nearly half of their 600,000-ton national goal. They're not just becoming self-sufficient, they're becoming exporters to countries with naturally perfect growing conditions. Here's what makes this truly revolutionary. If Saudi Arabia can farm fish and grow food in some of the harshest conditions on Earth, imagine what this technology could do in other desert regions. The Sahara, the Gobi, the Atacama, vast areas of useless land could become food-producing powerhouses. Saudi Arabia's Ministry of Agriculture announced a 430,000-square-foot aquaponic farm in Jubail Governorate in 2024. This facility will enhance biodiversity increase self-sufficiency, and improve food security while dramatically reducing water usage. And this is just one of many projects, most of which haven't been publicly announced yet. The next time someone tells you something is impossible, remember that Saudi Arabia is farming salmon in the desert and using fish waste to turn sand into gardens. They're not just adapting to harsh conditions, they're completely conquering them. This isn't just about fish or farming. It's about the fundamental human ability to look at a problem and flip it into a solution. Saudi Arabia took their greatest weakness, endless desert, and turned it into their greatest strength. The desert isn't dying anymore, it's being reborn, one fish at a time. The Saudis aren't waiting for perfect conditions, they're creating them. And that mindset might just be the most valuable thing you can take from this story.